we're, what we will do this evening is we're going to continue to kind of follow um, a line of thought that started developing last Sabbath, right there at the very end. Uh, the statement was read uh, around Prescott. And it was interesting that after I read that statement, and of course, I almost like apologized for it because of uh, those of you that know anything about us as a ministry, myself, especially understanding that around the daily controversy that came into Adventism and certain things that Prescott and Andrews did in the 1919 sessions. And you, when you start to know the history of those two men, then, I mean, pretty much everything that we're dealing with now that's erroneous within our within our church, it, it, that's pretty much they are the source of it. So, you know, I was kind of remiss to I read something by Prescott. Um, but the Lord blessed Prescott. Under the 1888 messages, he did a camp meeting out in Australia uh, that was very blessed. And the Lord had given him deep insights into that message. And he was highly respected. And he was a very educated individual. He's a very smart man. So uh, we got to give him credit there. Uh, so was A.G. Daniels. These are not these are not dumb people, and these are not people that did not know our message. And that's the thing that was very interesting to me as I was meditating on it was that wait a minute, I read a quote that perfectly coincides actually with this because what we read by Prescott shows clearly that he did understand the message, but at the same time there would be people that understood the message, men that would understand it, but that would not preach it and want to come up with something new. Now. Uh, some more things came out around that situation, especially around 1888. And I think it is very relevant to uh, what we're dealing with right now uh, in our movement. So we're going to talk about that today. And before I do that, then I will pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up. The Father, I come to name your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you so much that we were able to gather here together on the Sabbath. I thank you for the action. It is a privilege to be able to open your word. It is such a privilege to understand these things. It is a great privilege that your spirit would move upon our hearts and give us wisdom and discernment around the times we live. And so we thank you for that. I pray that you would speak through me this evening and not for any good that's in me, but that I desire to be used as a blessing and that you would bless those on the call this evening with truth and that anyone who might listen to this later would be blessed. We thank you that where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst. You promised this. We all come here. We have different trials. We have different difficulties. We lay those at your feet. We ask for the peace that passes all understanding. Help our minds to be clear, to discern, and pick up the truth for this time. I thank you that you have promised you will speak to us. And I pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So what I'd like to do is we think about <laughs> we think about Adventism today and we think about our culture. And so I just want to share a couple of thoughts before we begin to move into this. If you go with me to Matthew chapter 9, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, we read, about Matthew. Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. He's a tax collector. And Jesus comes to him in verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, we know that. Jesus was recruiting leaders, future leaders. Uh, there was 12 in particular. One of them betrayed him, 11, and then one would be replaced by Paul. He still had 12. would have 12 leaders. Some of them didn't lead very long. Some of them were martyred very early after his ascension. But the point is, is they would lead. But before they could lead, they had to follow. They had to be good followers. And I've heard this said before. And it's true. Before you can lead, you must learn to follow. You must be a good follower. Um, because it requires a level of humility 
to follow. Most people want to lead and they don't like the idea of following. They want to be out front. Um, but our message, brethren, is a message really that we're to give here at the end. It's a message of, of following because there were those that went before us that God blessed with deep spiritual insight. I mean, the more I delve into these things, the, the more I realize just how deep their spiritual insight was. And uh, it's humbling because, man, it's just, I'm nowhere close. And I don't think anyone in their right mind that understands the truth for this time, really what it is would say that they are even close to holding a candle to how God led these men and, and, and her in the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White. Um, they didn't have some of the disadvantages that we have now. And I think that's one of the reasons why God did what he did with them. Um, they didn't have the problems that we have with, you know, our food, our water, our air. Uh, they didn't have some of the distractions and, uh, you know, there was natural childbirth. I mean, there's just so many things that gave them some advantages that we don't have. And, and so God then greatly spiritually blessed them and basically said, I'm, want the torch of what I showed them to be passed down to a, a final generation. They'll make a declaration of this message that will actually repeat the message. And, um, and this people are going to be rewarded. 11th hour workers is what we could call them. These people are going to be rewarded with the same reward and the same blessings that I gave early. They're going to get that if they'll just do one thing, if they'll follow and they'll repeat. So this is hard today, though, in our culture, because everyone thinks or wants to be a leader. Um, we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you go with me there, about how people would be. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, this describes the church a lot of times i used to read this i thought this describes the world but this actually describes the church more so than it does the world at the end it says in verse one this know also that in the last days of which we live perilous times shall come we know that's true we're living in them for men shall be lovers of their own selves and that's where i'll stop i mean it goes on to talk about covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, but primarily are lovers of themselves. In the church, in the last days, there will be a lot of lovers of themselves, more than lovers of God. And this is going to cause a striving, a strife for supremacy, which is what we see. We see a lot of infighting and going back and forth. And, you know, that could all be resolved very quickly if people would humble themselves and just repeat the message that we've been given. So it makes you think of a quote it's taken from MS 62, 1905, page six. I've read it many times. It's become a, kind of a touchstone of my understanding of truth. And I uh, believe it should be all of ours, actually. But it's MS 62, 1905, page six. I've read it many times before I read it again. When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit. We've been learning about this. What are the pins and pillars of our faith? Let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. And let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. So those that were still alive, who had lived through what? Well, as we've been studying, those who had lived through the giving of the first and second angels' messages had gone on into the third angels' messages the truth had been developing. Those were the ones that were to speak, and the ones that had now died but had written on these things, they were to speak also. And then she says, gather up the rays of divine light that God has given as he has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. The truth will stand the test of time and trial. Now, many people ascribe their own idea to what that idea of truth is now. But as we have been studying and learning, 
she has to be talking about the giving of our messages and not in part, but in whole. And so this will make more sense as we continue. Let me read you one more quote too, though. This was taken from letter 87, page 1905. Letter 87, page 1905, or excuse me, 1905, pages two and three. Letter 87, 1905, pages two and three. The truths that have been substantiated by the manifest working of God are to stand fast. Let no one presume to move a pin or a foundation stone from the structure. Those who attempt to undermine the pillars of our faith are among those of whom the Bible says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, this is a very heavy statement because when we think about pillars of our faith, the first and second angel's messages, as they understood them, are pillars of our faith, especially the first angel's message, which is around definite time. I'm not going to go and talk about that because we have talked about that extensively up to this point. We're going to keep going forward to see some things. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to share screen and I'm going to read something to you. We're going to read it again. We read it last Sabbath, but we're going to, uh, we're, I'm going to be able to share screen, honey. You're going to have to turn that off for me. Um, we're going to read through this again. And I want uh, to uh, pay close attention to certain parts of it and then see if uh, these things are indeed confirmed. Um, let me do this here. As we look through some spirit prophecy statements and other things in principle. Now, this is Prescott writing. This is Prescott writing in the General Conference Bulletin, April 2nd, 1903. General Conference Bulletin, April 2nd, 1903. Now I want to put together the prophecies and the facts concerning this Advent movement in 1843 and 1844. Now I want you to notice, Prescott is very clear here on what constitutes the first and second angel's message. When he puts those two numbers together, you know he has to know that. I asked someone the other day if they could explain to me the two disappointments. <laughs> I was testing them. They, they claim they're the remnant. Actually, some of our people in our group are in their Facebook group. And uh, I became acquainted with these men. They, <clears throat> there's a particular gentleman out of Russia. <clears throat> and he calls himself Pavel. And he's teaching. He's claiming they, they defer to him a lot. <clears throat> anyway, they claim they're the remnant. All right, great. I hope you are. I mean, I'd like to meet them. So I, but I also, too, know that I'm to try the spirits and to test them, see whether or not they be of God. So I asked one of their leaders, or one that they defer to. I don't know how all this works. I mean, I've seen this kind of behavior before. So, but anyway, I asked him, I said, we, what do you know about the two disappointments? I don't know what you're talking about. Why are you testing me? That's interesting. I said, you tested me. <laughs> um, but uh, you asked me questions about myself, who I think I am. Asked me if I thought I was a prophet and different things like that. And I don't think that. But but I, I'm, just, I'm just curious, you know, well, uh, then he came back and said uh, something like, uh, I don't need to get into these non-salvational issues. So, well, the first and second angel's message is a salvational issue if you're Seventh-day Adventist. It is, actually. And so uh, we see here that clearly, though, <clears throat> I digress, that Prescott understood the first and second angel's message. He wouldn't be putting those two numbers together. He understood the two disappointments. Note now, the pairs of events, the first message, second message, and the midnight cry, and the third message, and now in our time, the message of Revelation 18, uniting with the message of the third angel, those are, those are definite facts in the development of this Advent message in this generation. Definite facts. Okay, so he knows. He understands very clearly. Now, he understands that, or believes he understands, that they're under the giving of Revelation 18, which is the greater fall of Babylon, the greater moral fall of Babylon. Um. He goes on to say, no, <clears throat> on the other hand, in 1844, exactly that happened, which the scriptures said would happen. And our high priest changed his ministry from the holy place to the most holy place. The bridegroom came at just the time the cry was raised. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The messages that were given were in God's order. 
and they were to do just the work that God had in mind and fulfill his definite purpose for that time. Now, it sounds like Prescott's very well acquainted then. We've been reading with uh, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, chapters 21 to 29. That Prescott is obviously very well acquainted with what she says in those chapters because it sounds like he's almost quoting her verbatim here. So it is with the third angel. And so it is with the union of all three in the angel of Revelation 18 in the wonderful manifestation of the power that will bring the coming of the Lord. Now, we need to talk about this third angel, okay? Because a lot of people don't understand this. It's going to become more clear as we go through this. A lot of times when people think of the third angel, they think of 1888 message. Or they think also in concert with that, we think of the false Sabbath, Sunday law, and the papacy. Okay, this is the third angel. And that's, that's where we're at as Adventists. We're giving the third angel's message, and they don't understand that there's more to it than that. Now, Prescott did. He was clear on it. But now today, coming down to our time, we're not so clear. So we're hopefully going to clear up some of that confusion this evening. Now, is there any relation between these things? Certainly, a most definite and clear relation. You mark the steps. The first angel's message prepared the people for exactly the thing that did take place. It was given under God's providence. It was under his guidance. It prepared the people that they might unite intelligently with our high priest in his change of ministry. They did not know it at the time, but that was God's purpose. The midnight cry prepared them that they should step right over with the high priest into the most holy place. The third angel's message, with all these other messages united with it, now that's important, should make perfectly clear and distinct the way into the holiest of all and should fashion the minds of the people directly and definitely upon the present work of Christ, our mediator and high priest in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary above as a definite fact. You see, so we need all three angels' messages to do that. We need the first and second angels' message to prove, not only to ourselves, because we got to hold on to this, we got to hold fast, we won't let go, but also to those that we would witness to that this is a definite fact. This is where things are now in prophetic time. Now that should be distinctly brought out in the third angel's message. And with that, of course, will come the clearest revelation of the gospel ministry for this time, the blotting out of sin in this generation, thus preparing the way of the Lord. Now watch this. These events did not come by chance. The facts of history concerning this Advent movement and the facts of prophecy come together according to God's purpose. And we find ourselves now facing the very next and last development in these steps of experience in the Advent message. And what is that? It is the hour of temptation that is to come upon all the world to try all them that dwell upon the face of the earth. And the message of Revelation 18, united with the message of the third angel, will prepare a people to stand in that hour of temptation. If the third angel's message is understood and preached as the gospel for this day, it will bless the people in the very experience through which they are passing. Now, watch what he, he says here. Now, he's going to define what he just said there. I'm going to read that again. And what we're getting ready to read next is the definition of what he just said. If the third angel's message is understood and preached as the gospel for this day, it will bless the people in the very experience through which they are passing. And so now he says, now that preaching of Christ and him crucified, that preaching of the righteousness of Christ is the gift of God through faith in Jesus which does not extend to and take in these definite developments of Advent history, of Advent experience, and these definite developments of the truth for this generation is not the preaching of righteous by faith or Christ crucified that God would have preached to the people now. So he's talking about this understanding of the third angel's message, the sentence that precedes this, and he defines it now, what we just read, but that is the 1888 message. And he's saying that the 1888 message is not going to be preached as it should be preached unless it takes into account the past history of our experience. And that's the first and second angel's messages, brother. Now watch this. And do not misunderstand me. I will speak in the plainest manner. You know that I'm not preaching against the forgiveness of sin, the righteousness of Christ, and the glory of the cross of Christ, 1888 message. But what I want to emphasize is this that not by going off on one side and ignoring all the historical truth and all the prophetic truth and simply preaching a general message of salvation through faith in Christ without applying God's message of salvation through faith in Christ to this generation, 
is not the preaching that God wants in this generation. Now, what we want to ask ourselves is this. Is this Prescott? Is only this Prescott that thinks this way? Or is this how all of Adventism thought? Well, we're going to see that Adventism thought this way. And Prescott is merely, as a minister, repeating the truth as is understood. He's saying this in 1903. The preaching of the glory of the cross of Christ, the preaching of the light that shines from Calvary's cross, the preaching of the righteousness of Christ as our only hope of salvation must in this generation extend to a definite application and enforcement of these truths in the light of Advent history and Advent prophecy. Again, you connect the 1888 message directly to our past messages. You know, the 1888 message was to refresh. It's a refreshing. Now, if I'm going to refresh something, that means I'm going to put something back into what I already had. If I got a glass of water and I drank half a glass of water and I said, can you please refresh my water? Well, it's going to add to the water I have. It's not going to totally replace it. It's a refreshing or it was to be watering God's people because they'd become dry. So it wasn't that their truth was no longer valid or needed to be put away for something else. It just needed to be refreshed or watered back to a life that it had lost. That's what the 1888 message would do. It wasn't to the exclusion, okay? Now, she goes, he goes on to say here, and when those truths are preached in the light of Advent history and Advent prophecy, they will save people from sin and from sinning now. Well, praise God. Because what I have found is that I have been studying these messages. I have a greater desire than ever before to separate from the world and from sin. Because God is going to judge this world by fire and he's going to judge his people by the truth that we have. And if I want to be saved and sealed, time to get with the program, there's not much time left. It goes on to say, they will prepare a people to stand in the hour of temptation that faces us and will prepare a people to meet the Lord in the air and so to ever be with the Lord. And that is the message to be preached in this generation. Now, you got to consider, Prescott really thought that Jesus would come even in his lifetime. The first generation Adventist, Prescott is a second generation Adventist. First generation Adventists really believed that Christ would come in their lifetime. So as it was for them, it still is for us, brother. Nothing's changed. Let us make as clear as possible what God's definite purpose for his work is now, that we may all unite to cooperate with God's purpose for this time, that there may be just as much the one voice that shall speak the one message. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. As what heard when the one man, John the Baptist, went forth with his message. And now he's going to clarify even more what he just said there in yellow, highlighted, that there may be just as much the one voice. Okay, what's that one voice? Thus, we shall not have a message of one sort on this coast. And now I've added in italics or in brackets here, <laughs> just so we can kind of really think about it now. He's writing this in 1903. How does it apply now? Thus, we shall not have a message of one sort on this coast, bracketed corporate Seventh-day Adventist church or self-supporting self independent ministry, and a message of another sort on the other coast corporate Seventh-day Adventist church or self-supporting independent ministry and a message of some other sort in some other country. There will be a one worldwide message with only one voice ever preaching salvation from sin through the faith in God's provision, a complete deliverance from sin, the blotting out of sin and the salvation of God fully revealed. Now, I'm going to tell you, Prescott understands the truth. This is spot on. And I'm amazed that a man that could know this and say this could yet do the things that he went on to do. It just shows how dangerous it is when someone begins to go down a path and will not allow the spirit of prophecy to correct them. Because Prescott went on to go to Europe and meet a man named Conradi. 
or Kadri, one of the two. It's Conradi, I'm pretty sure. And Conradi began to teach him ideas around the daily that were not in harmony with our understanding of the message of the first and second angel. Okay? Definitely not the first angel because it was definite time and you destroy definite time under the first angel when you change the daily. And that's a whole other topic. But uh, I've done quite a bit on it, but I think even now I should do something again because there'd be greater clarity and understanding around it. But bottom line is, he's, and with Daniels, start taking Daniels with him, they start going down a line of thinking that Ellen White said, look, leave that alone. There's no light in that. There's nothing to that. They, I truly believe, thought that they were advancing the 1888 message. I think that's what they really thought they were doing. They thought they were doing a good thing and they weren't willing to stop. And so she then writes a quote and we're going to read this statement again. We've read it before. And this one comes out in 1900. Now watch this. And this is what the Lord alerted me to the other, well, after Sabbath, after we had presented on this last Sabbath, that, wow, I mean, right here is a perfect example of this quote that we're reading right now. There are those who know the truth, but do not practice it. These greatly long for some new, strange thing to present. In their great zeal to become original, some will bring in fanciful ideas, which are but chaff. And I can only imagine, I mean, Prescott, man, he's following the footsteps of some pretty big men. You know, you got Lothborough, you got Andrews, you got Bates, James White, Ellen White. You have, who else? Um, Haskell. I mean, you've got some big people. And, uh, you know, you're a second generation Adventist. I mean, you want to be original? You want to be big, I guess, uh, kind of smart? Even now, there's a descending from the sublime and living issues for this time to the ridiculous and fanciful and sensational minds stand ready to catch up suppositions and guesses and human theories and false science as truth to be accepted and taught. These put the test of salvation on speculation without one plane, thus saith the Lord. Now, that right there, the test of salvation, what is the test of salvation for us as Adventists? Well, it's more than just the Father-Son message, brother. I'm going to tell you that. It is these messages that we've been talking about. It's a test for us. These messages test us. We, we claim to be Adventists. Are we really? And there are, anyway, let me keep going. They thus bring in a mass of rubbish, wood, hay, and stubble as precious material to be laid upon the foundation stone. And this is interesting that she uses these words here. We were reading about Miller's dream. Uh, the last two Sabbaths, we dealt with that. This will not stand a test of fire, but will be consumed. Now watch this. And if the ones who have made themselves believe these theories, now I believe that's either those that teach it or those that have gone underneath the teaching. Those either have been teaching or those who have been taught. If the ones who have made themselves believe these theories are so self-deceived and know not the truth, yet are converted, their life is saved as by fire through repentance and humiliation before God. They're going to have to acknowledge if they're going to be saved. They're going to have to acknowledge that they believed error, that they taught it or they believed it. That requires humility. A lot of humility. People say, well, you know, Bill, you talk about how you were once in Shepherd's Rod. I had somebody throw that up at me. How could you know anything? You were once in Shepherd's Rod. I could name the man that did it. And y'all know his name. He's a part of a prominent ministry now. I worked with him at PHM. You know why I tell people I was one time a part of Shepherd's Rod and was deceived by Shepherd's Rod? Because it's humility. I'm not so smart. I can't be tricked. If you think you can't be tricked, you're already deceived. If you think you can't be deceived, you already are. Your adversary, the devil, he's cunning. He knows how to deceive. And I'm well aware of it. I believe some stuff. Looking back now, how did I believe that? I'll tell you how you believe it. Believe one lie, you believe them all. And that's the problem that we have right now in our movement. There are untruths in our movement. Truth mixed with error. It is that error that will take people out if they don't repent of it. It goes on to say, they have been dealing in common things in place of the sacred. Many catch up ideas which are of no consequence and place them before the flock of God as food <clears throat> when they are only chaff, which will never benefit or strengthen the flock of God, but will keep them in the lowlands 
because they are feeding upon that which contains not the least virtue of nourishment. What is chaff to the wheat? We need to be dealing in wheat, brethren. And that's what we're striving to do here. So there is this thing now. And I know when I first heard it, it's around the 1888 message. And I believe it's a carryover of error from our corporate experience. When we were exposed to 1888 there, I know I was exposed to 1888 message through a ministry called Light Bears Ministry years ago. Ty Gibson, James Rafferty, some of you know them. They've now united with uh, Jason, uh, 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 David Ashrick. They've united with David Ashrick and they're working together. And I mean, we know David Ashrick and the stuff he's done. A lot of us in the father son message because he's, I mean, I know that man personally. I knew him when he was, you know, just a pretty small guy. Now he's probably one of the most recognized figures in all of Adventism, David Asher. It's really amazing. Anyway, that's when I became acquainted with it. And, and it was like my acquaintance with it was like, it was everything. 1888 message is everything. If you got this, you got everything. And I think we've carried that over. And we don't understand that that is not the case. And, and here we see Prescott very well shows that. Now, do we find those same ideas in the spirit of prophecy? Well, let's take a look. This quote is taken from MS 31, 1890, paragraph six. MS 31, 1890, paragraph six. Now, she's writing this two years after the 1888 message, and watch what she says here. But since the General Conference of 1888, Satan has been working with special power through unconsecrated elements to weaken the confidence of God's people in the voice, pardon me this evening, <clears throat> pardon me, to weaken the confidence of God's people in the voice that has been appealing to them for these many years. If he can succeed in this, then through misapplication of scripture, he will lead many to cast away their confidence in the past work under the messages Thus, he would set them adrift with no solid foundation for their faith, hoping to bring them fully under his power. Now, that is serious. So what Satan would do is he would say, well, look, <clears throat> that 1888 message, okay, let's just focus on that only then. And let's not deal with these past messages that you all did. If I can get people deceived into doing that, what can I do? I can set them adrift. They'll have no solid foundation for their faith and I'll be able to bring them fully under my power. Let the attention of our people be called to the special work of the Spirit of God as it has been connected with the rise and progress of the three messages. Not just the third angel's message, the three messages. That's first, second, and third. And a blessing will result to the whole body. Boom. I mean, Prescott was saying the same thing, right? Sounds like Prescott understood our message understood what Ellen White said about these things. A revival of faith and interest in the testimonies of the spirit of God. And brethren, as I'm understanding and I believe the truth of this is, is this straight testimony. A revival of faith and interest in the testimonies of the spirit of God, I put in parentheses, straight testimony, will lead to the obtaining of a helpful experience in the things of God. Now we know that she says that many will reject the straight testimony. <clears throat> and we see this. People reject the truth of the first and second angel's message <clears throat> as they understood it <clears throat> and are replacing it with other ideas. They try to say things like the first angel's message is the father-son message. They try to say things like the second angel's message is, uh, you know, is just the papacy. I mean, there's, there's, just, there's just errors there misunderstandings around things. Let's read another quote. She says, God has given, this is taken from MS 31, 1890, paragraph nine. MS 31, 1890, paragraph nine. God has given the messages of Revelation 14, plural now. That's the first, second, and third angels. Their place in the line, in line, excuse me, let me start over again. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in line of prophecy, and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. 
The first and second angel's messages are still true for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. Now, why do you think she might be saying that? Well, she told you just a moment ago here that since 1888, this would be coming in. And so she's clarifying, look, we can't leave these messages. They go all the way to the end. They run parallel with everything else that follows, which we're living under some of that now. The third angel proclaims this warning with a loud voice. After these things said, John, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power and the earth was lighted with his glory. Revelation 18, one. In this illumination, the light of all the three messages is combined. So, you know, like I said, we were talking about this a moment ago. Many of us thought that when, you know, we, we give the third angel's message, we give the three angel's message and we think of just that third angel's message. We don't think of all three of them combined, that that is the third angel that is lighted by the light and glory of, as we have understood, the fourth angel of Revelation 18. So Revelation 18 is like a refreshing, a enlightening of all that has gone before. And that is the first, second, third angel's message, 1888 message, all of it, all combined. Some of those, this is taken from MS 31, 1890, paragraph seven. MS 31, 1890, paragraph seven. Some of those who are newly come to the faith claim to have special light from God in regard to these messages. But their new light lead them to set aside established truths that are the pillars of our faith. Brethren, that's where we are now. We are in this full blown. This is full blown Laodiceanism we're living in. They do not understand, and they are constantly preaching ideas, teaching ideas. They're totally contrary and in conflict with the foundations of our movement, and it's so easy to test them and to know if it's light or not, but most people don't even know how to do it because they don't know our message, so they get led to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and that's what she said. Before Christ comes, every wind of doctrine will be blown within Adventism, and that is what's happening. And every wind of doctrine in the Father-Son message, brethren, not just corporate Adventism that we came out of, but even in the Father-Son movement where we all have landed. Now, praise the Lord for the Father-Son movement. I don't want to minimize the maximum uh, power and benefit of the truth of knowing who our God is, because it is an amazing thing, and I know what it did for me, and I would not be here talking to you now if it wasn't for that. So I don't want to minimize that. But I also realize, and I have seen it, now being in this movement for eight years now, roughly, that there are many pitfalls, many pitfalls. And there are many voices in our movement saying, this is the truth. I have the truth. That is the truth. Many leaders who do not know how to follow, because if they knew how to follow, they'd be giving the message that we're talking about tonight. And I was a part of a ministry that professed to follow the pioneers, but obviously does not know how. They misrepresent and misapply the scriptures. They misplace the messages of Revelation 14 and set aside the work which these messages have accomplished. Thus, they reject the great way march which God himself has established. Since their new light leads them to tear down the structure which the Lord has built up, watch this, we may know that he is not guiding them. And I put in parentheses again, Corporate Seventh-day Adventist Church or self-supporting independent ministries. We may know that God is not guiding them by these things. If their new light leads them to tear down the structure which God has built up, we can know of a fact that we don't need to deal in that, that we're not safe there. Now, we... Uh, We have some interesting things in all of this. Um, last week, a sister recommended some uh, tracks, uh, studies put together on the original three Advent messages, and I have them in my possession. So I, I began to go through and start reading. And I'm going to close with this article from James White. 
written April 18, 1854 in the Advent Review of the Sabbath Herald. It was written, I don't have it uh, to put up. Uh, I, I'm wondering if I might be able to find it uh, on the Ellen White CD-ROM, but I just have it here in hard copy, so I'm going to read it. Let me give you the reference again. It's April 18, 1854 from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald by James White, and it's called We Are Adventists. We Are Adventists. Um, it says, and I guess I'll go off screen share for a moment because I'm going to come back to this. Save the leading men among those who profess to adhere to the views taught by William Miller, when in fact, they have given up many of those strong points of difference between William Miller and his opponents. But what has called out this new sect or class of believers from which this sect has been formed, which claims and glories in the name of Adventist? Now watch this. He's going to, talk, he's going to really nail it down to what is an Adventist. That's why it's so important. We answer, first, the doctrine of the second Advent as taught by William Miller or the announcement of the first angel, Revelation 14, 6, 7. The hour of God's judgment has come. Second, the strong movement in 1844 occasioned by the proclamation of the words of the second angel, which brought them away from the different churches to which they belong. These two great movements called out the Advent people from the different churches, and a portion of them now claim the name of Adventists. But strange to tell, they regard the very movements that called them from the churches and made them a distinct people decidedly wrong. And we're doing that today. Most of them call the doctrines they then held errors and the influences which moved them to separate from their brethren of the several churches delusive. Then why have they not, like honest men and women, retraced their steps they took in errors path? Now watch this. Why not frankly confess to their former brethren of the churches who stood so nobly against the Advent movement in 1843 and 1844 that these movements were delusions. Now these movements were either wrong and a complete delusion or they were under the special providence of God and as a whole right. If they were then wrong and then those who were influenced by them to leave the church should at once go back to those churches, confess their errors and unite with them again, is it not perfect folly to glory in the distinguishing name of Adventists and then turn around and curse the very means that made them a distinct people? Now, that is a very powerful statement he makes right here just now. He says, listen, you're going to stay in the Adventist church. You're going to call yourself an Adventist, but you're going to turn around. You're going to say those first and second angels messages, which called you out are delusions. Watch what he goes on to say about that. If those movements were right, then... Is it right to remain separate from those churches, which the Advent people separate from to enjoy their freedom? But let such highly prize these, uh, those ain't, excuse me, let me read this again. If those movements were right, then it is right to remain, or then it is right to remain separate from those churches, which the Advent people separate from to enjoy their freedom. But let such highly prize those angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 8, which made them a distinct people. Now, if it be right for any people to claim the name of Adventist, but we doubt the propriety of the claiming of such, certainly that class who have given up the strong points of original Adventist faith as taught by William Miller and now regard as error and delusive the very messages and influence which called them from the churches and made them a distinct people should be the very last to claim the name of Adventist. So he's saying, look, if you don't believe the first and second angel's message as William Miller taught it, don't call yourself an Adventist. Do we hear anybody talking about that stuff today? Absolutely not. We don't. We claim to stand on the original Advent faith. Therefore, do not reject the past movements on this great question, which have called out a people to prepare for the coming of the Lord. And as to the great fundamental doctrines taught by William Miller, we see no reason to change our views. But our views have changed, brethren. There's no doubt about that. We claim all the light of the past time on the glorious theme and cherish it as from heaven. And we cheerfully let the providence of God and the plain Bible testimony correct our past view of the sanctuary and give us a more harmonious system of truth and a firmer, uh, a firmer 
basis. Yes, it's hard to read it. A firm basis of faith. While the Advent Review occupies its present position, it may be expected that its columns will be enriched with spiritual articles upon the second advent from the pens of William Miller, Lynch, Fitch, Hale, Soares, and others written 10 or 12 years ago. Because they understood what we've been talking about tonight. Prescott understood it. They all understood it. They understood what our message was, and they realized that they had to stand on it. And you didn't just take the 1888 message like we've done now, and we say, look, that's all we need. They understood it all worked together. It was a collective whole. And if you didn't take it all into account, don't call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist, especially if you don't want to bring in the first and second angels messages. If you want to change those in any way, if any leader would be confronted with that and would either ignore it or change it, they are not being led of the Lord. You say, Bill, that's strong. Like, you're talking... You're talking tough tonight. Well, we'll close with this quote. Just as long as God has a church, he will have those who will cry aloud and spare not, who will be his instruments to reprove selfishness and sins. They will not shun declaring the whole counsel of God where the men will hear or forbear. I saw the individuals would rise up against the plain testimonies. It does not suit their natural feelings. They would choose to have smooth things spoken to them and have peace cried in their ears. I view the church in a more dangerous condition than they ever have been. Now, she's writing this under two spiritual gifts. So Spiritual Gifts Volume 1 came out in 1858. So this is sometime in the 1860s. Okay, the church is in a dangerous condition then. Where are we now? Experimental religion is known, but by a few. The shaking must soon take place to purify the church. Preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found in God's word. Now watch that. No scruples. In other words, listen, I'm to do exactly what I'm doing. I shouldn't hold back on. Probably probably actually am nicer than I should be because I know then in their day, they named them. I could start naming tonight. I could name names. I could name ministries. But I don't know. To do that, would maybe minimize the ability for people to receive what's being said, but they would actually name people. They would name them. Let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success, they are afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous, and they lower the standard of truth and conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. Man, we live today in a society that's so politically correct that, you know, you words, then now they say, now, thoughts hurt. <laughs> your thoughts hurt me. Your words are hurting me. This is the most absurd thing, but this is the culture we live in to the point now that our words, what I'm saying tonight is hate speech. I could, if I was living in America, potentially I could come into my house, arrest me, and charge me with a felony for what I'm doing tonight. Maybe that's why the Lord took me out of America and put me in Romania. <laughs> He's moved me on to Albania, so we have some time to do this because these kinds of things are going to become hate speech, brother. They, you will, be a, you will be a hater for saying the stuff that we're talking about tonight. I saw that God could not make such successful. The truth must be made pointed and the necessity of a decision urged. And as the false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth things, the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and leave the result with God. And that's truly where you only can leave it. It's God's work. It's God's business. God will make himself responsible for taking care of those who will give the message. And as we open this evening, there'll be many disappointments. I can promise you that many trials. It seems like they've been amped up even more since, since, uh, since we started doing this. I would never thought when I came back from Bulgaria back in the fall and felt the unction that I would preach this, what has happened in my home and some of the things that have happened to us since I started doing this would have ever happened. If you had told me, I wouldn't have believed you. But I know that the devil hates these things, and I just have to leave the results with God, and he works these things out. Very merciful. I'm grateful to each and every one of you all that come on these calls and, and have been supportive of us and have prayed for us. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of this, even though it's difficult. Believe me, it's difficult. But, um, but I'm glad that uh, there's no fear in it because I know I'm doing the truth. I know I'm doing the Lord's work, and I just pray that we all be counted worthy to not only know the truth, but to be sanctified by it. And so 
with that this evening, I'm going to close our message with prayer and then we'll open up for discussion. Father, again, I come to you, name your son, Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you so much for what a clear path you've given us. I, I understand now more clearly than ever that when Ellen White said things in spirit of prophecy, like you, you've made such a plain path for our feet that none need to err. It's just, it's all there for us. I really, I really understand what that means now. That those statements make sense to me. And I'm grateful for that. And I pray that that would be the same for all those that would not only hear this message, but other messages have been presented on this subject matter, or that as you lead them to the places where they can research and study these things for themselves to see this more clearly, that you'd open up their minds and just thank you for the great love you have for us. I know you want to save each and every one of us. Um, we can meditate and dwell in that love. And of course, those ideas are contained within the 1888 message. So we're grateful for that refreshing that you want to give us in light of all these other things that you've given us. And so we just pray for understanding. And again, I thank you for your love and mercy. I pray these things in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.